even from a classical perspective, there's a certain apparent mismatch between the macroscopic and the microscopic world. But you just learn to deal with that. Like, you know, I, I think the the kind of revolutions in modern physics brought in a whole host of new difficulties. It's not about reconciling the macroscopic with the microscopic. It's rather that like certain questions that we think must have answers, <laughs> right? And must be answered in order for us to have a coherent conception of what the world is like. Quantum mechanics just doesn't answer like a basic question. Like what is the stuff of the world? Like what's it made up of? Like what's the basic fundamental stuff that makes up the world? It's not so clear how to answer that question um, from a quantum mechanical point of view. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 81. And this episode is with Anubhav Vasudevan, who is associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago, where he works generally in formal epistemology and the history of logic, though he's published in a number of other areas. This episode was particularly fun for me, not only because Anubhav has a lot of great and deep opinions about the nature of philosophy, physics, math, and a number of other areas that I'm really interested in, but He's also a student of Heim Gaifman, who is guest on Robinson's podcast 111, 21, and 31. Those are easy numbers for me to remember. Who was my professor at Columbia and still is an extraordinarily important figure in my life. So we got to talk a lot about that and what Heim taught him about math and philosophy. Then we go into some of those things that I've already mentioned, which are just Anubhav's really interesting, deep thoughts on math, physics, logic, and how they relate to philosophy. Then after that, we go into some of Anubhav's scholarship in the history of logic, one of those two areas that I mentioned. And in, particularly, in particular, we touch on the peripatetic school's logic, and the peripatetic school was the school started by Aristotle in Athens. And then also on, we also talk about Leibniz's logic, and he's done some really ground, groundbreaking work on logic in conjunction with Marco Malink of NYU. And a couple of things about that. One... The last third of this episode in which we talk about Leibniz and the peripatetics is a bit more technical, but I think it's very interesting, very important for those interested in logic. And then a few other things for, for those of you who don't know too much about logic. Propositional logic is, so we, we talk about the Stoics, um, I mean, sorry, not the Stoics, the peripatetics propositional logic. And Propositional logic is just the branch of logic that is concerned with basic atomic sentences or propositions and composing larger and more complex propositions out of them, and perhaps then evaluating or expressing arguments that are based on these sentences. And there's a lot more to say there. And then first order logic, which was created by or the, the first, who, who got us really closest there, a huge towering figure in analytic philosophy is Gottlob Frege. And first order logic is tremendously important uh, in philosophy today, in linguistics, in math, in computer science. But first order logic is a significant complication of propositional logic in which there are objects introduced, quantifiers, uh, properties, but we don't go too in-depth into those into these things. Uh, one term, though, that goes undefined that I think was kind of important it, when we're talking about Leibniz's logic in particular is that of a signature. And the signature of a formal language essentially just introduces the non-logical symbols of the language. So whether we're using any specific function symbols, relations, or constants that 
are not in say the the standard first order language with the quality but that's all background that you might not need and you can also go to there's a really great article on the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy on classical logic by stuart shapiro and Teresa curry kissel that also has some more background information if you want that i don't think you need it and like i said it's only really relevant to the last third or so of the episode the last caveat i'll really mention is that there was a lot of background episode background noise in this episode i did my best to scrub it and yeah check out my other channel robinson eats in which i eat today i had little debbie's strawberry shortcake rolls ice cream and it was really good well it there wasn't enough strawberry, but it was really bad in a good way and had that really fake strawberry syrup that I like. Maybe you don't like. And also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and leave reviews, comments, likes, all that stuff. Extraordinarily helpful. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Anubhav. You and I, we both had the same professor at Columbia, uh, Heim That's Gaifman, right. which is actually how I uh, found out about you in the first place, because Heim was telling me about you as his student. And so Heim's been a guest on the show uh, four times now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked to him yesterday, so we still talk a lot. And uh, Scott Shapiro of mm-hmm. Yale was also one of his students, at least for math logic. And mm-hmm. uh, we talked about him on our episode and he had this really funny story where I guess he was struggling with some proof of something. And I don't know, maybe math logic too. Mm-hmm. And Haim sat down with him and said, it's okay, Scott, even my good students have trouble with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds very much like Haim. Yeah. That it sounds does. very much like Haim. Yeah. yeah. And so I I was curious what, what studying with Haim was like for you and how you got sucked into logic and the technical side of philosophy in the first place. Um, well, that, I mean, those are kind of two different questions. Maybe I'll just start by saying something about Haim. Um, he was a really great, um, he was a really, in, in some respects, he he was a really great PhD advisor, you know, so there's a complex sort of sociology (laughs) that, um, that, that, uh, exists between doctoral advisors and their advisees because doctoral advisors, PhD advisors have lots of different conceptions of what the advisor advisee relationship is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. So some of them have a more casual attitude towards their advisees where they think of them sort of as, um, you know, future intellectual colleagues, um, you know, maybe even like friends in some, in some social capacity. (laughs) Um, Haim, Haim's attitude is very traditional when it comes to that relationship, that specific relationship, the relationship between a PhD advisor and advisee is very much a relationship between a teacher and a student. I would even distinguish that. Um, from the relationship between, say, a master and a pupil, <laughs> or from, um, uh, you, you know, I, Heim never tried to make me into sort of a disciple of, of his, um, where I would I would learn about his philosophical view of things and then go out into the world and promote it or something. He was never like that. He was like a teacher in the best sense of the term. He wanted to teach me things, um, mm-hmm. and he really values that 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 functional role. Um, a lot. And so we would spend a lot of time um, with him explaining things to me and, you know, me being the student and asking him questions. And I, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And then um, he, you know, he, he, he taught me. So I was a kind of late arrival to philosophy. I studied physics as an undergraduate. And then I sort of transitioned into philosophy um, about a year or two into pursuing um, a PhD in physics. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so, so I, I came to it a little bit later than, than, um, than some students of philosophy. And so I was sort of trying to get, um, uh, just get my bearings in terms of like what philosophy was supposed to be. Right. And it was a long time before I started to clarify in my own mind what the relationships are between philosophy and physics um, and other kinds of intellectual activities. And one of the things that Heim uh, really taught me, uh, and it's, it's a lesson that I still um, like really try to apply in my own thinking and philosophical writing is that, um, you know, it's really important when you're doing philosophy of a more technical sort, you would always tell me this. It's really important when you're doing philosophy of a technical sort to know when you're doing mathematics and when you're doing philosophy and not mm. to get the two confused. You know, like mathematics is mathematics and philosophy is philosophy <laughs> and they're not the same and they don't overlap. Now it could be that like doing mathematics can um, invigorate your philosophical instincts to, they, you know, doing mathematics can get you to think about a philosophical problem, maybe even doing a certain kind of philosophy can eventually like lead in the direction of sharpening whatever problem it is that you're thinking about to the point where you have a mathematical problem to solve. But mathematics is mathematics. <laughs> it holds up or it doesn't as mathematics. And in that sense, it's, it's different than philosophy. And it's really important when you're, when you're doing technical philosophy to know when you're doing mathematics and when you're doing philosophy. It sounds like a kind of obvious thing. You should always know when you're doing mathematics and when you're doing philosophy. But it really isn't so obvious unless you're really attentive to that distinction. So that, that was something that I definitely learned um, from, from working with him. There isn't a kind of, you know, he's, he's a very rigorous thinker in his own way when it comes to mathematics, because mathematics is rigorous. <laughs> yeah. And then when he's doing philosophy, sometimes um, he's less rigorous, but that's because philosophy is less rigorous as a subject. And so coming to accept that sort of duality in terms of how I approach the subject was, was a really important lesson that he taught me. I, I would also say, you know, there's something for, there is something frustrating about working with, you know, a philosopher who's, who's, who's not to, I, I don't mean to be, there's something frustrating about working with a philosopher who's, who's, whose primary training is in mathematics. Right. Yeah. Because, I, should, you know, uh, I should, should just say, yeah. so I think I mentioned to you that I was talking with Haim yesterday and mm -hmm. I also had just interviewed Noam Chomsky, and when I mentioned uh -huh. when I mentioned Noam Chomsky, his uh -huh. one of the first things he said was, "Well, Noam is not a mathematician." <laughs> he <said> that <laughs> That's right. very somewhat disparagingly. He, well, what's, fu what's funny is 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 um, what's funny is you know, when, so when you're talking to a philosopher whose training is in mathematics, there's this funny experience. I, I remember having many experiences like this with Heim where I would be trying to communicate to him something, some philosophical idea that I thought was really, um, really interesting. And I'd, I'd like present it to him and he, he wouldn't kind of get what I was talking about because I hadn't clarified it sufficiently. And so I would clarify it more to bring it closer to say yeah. something like a mathematical claim. And he, he still wouldn't understand what I was saying until, you know, so I'd clarify it still more until I got to the mathematical claim or the mathematical kernel, let's say of the original philosophical idea, which I would put to him just as a mathematical claim, at which point he would say it's obvious. So then there's this like weird kind of dialectical um, problem here where, you know, in mathematics, when you really understand something, the kind of accompanying phenomenology of that understanding is that the idea presents itself to you as in some sense obvious. Right. 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 And so you kind of vacillate. There, there's only two extremes, right? There's like incoherence, like you're not speaking clearly at all. And obviousness <laughs> where everything is just like almost, you know, just like evident. So evident it doesn't need to be spoken in philosophy. We're often trying to like sort of say interesting things in the middle space, this middle ground between, you know, we don't, we want to be totally incoherent, but at the same time, we don't want to be like just, you know, putting forward tautology or sociological truths or something yeah. like that. And so yeah. it can be, it can be a kind of um, a dialectical obstacle, let's say <laughs> in, 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 um, and trying to discuss philosophy with somebody who has a kind of mathematical way of thinking. Yeah. Um, he, yeah. He's working on uh, mathematical beauty right now, a little mm -hmm. paper on it. And it dovetails quite nicely with what you just said, because his general thesis about mathematical beauty is that it's all about epistemic clarity and something is mathematically beautiful 
when you see it and you go essentially from incoherence to coherence, like in a flash, more or less. Yeah. And he uses the examples of these tiling problems, which you might know about. Yeah, I, I, I know most of his examples because we probably talked about them at some point in the <laughs> yeah. past, but like, you mean like the chessboard example, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's another aspect of, I'm sure if you've had conversations with Heim, um, this is this has come out of those conversations that, you know, there's, there's another aspect of mathematical reasoning that he tends to emphasize in his discussions of mathematics, which I think is really um underappreciated in sort of philosophical discussions of mathematical methodology. And that's like the part of mathematics, which is kind of playful, which is kind of, you know, tinkering with something as he often yeah. does it. Yeah. 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 Where you're, there's a kind of concept that you don't yet have a full grip mm -hmm. on and you sort of just play with it until you can start to see how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. And the style of interaction is, is very kind of childish. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a playful style of interaction because you're often toying with it, experimenting with it, testing its limits, conjecturing what might happen when you do something to it and seeing if that conjecture is borne out. And then gradually over time, you start to get a feel for how, for how it works, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then your sort of playful conjectures take on a kind of seriousness where they start to feel more like, like hy hypotheses, right? Like now I think I, I feel like I know that there's like a theorem here to be proven. And you sort of know that, you know, in advance of having any kind of evidence for it, but you feel really confident about that. Yeah. This is the funniest thing. The funny, the funny thing about mathematics. And I think the part of mathematical reasoning that um, um, that's, that's, that's difficult to account for is that on the one hand, like mathematics teaches you certain fixed and rigorous like standards of proof, right? We know what a mathematical proof is um, so that it's very clear when you're thinking about some mathematical object, when you're sort of short of having a proof of say some theorem um, about that object. And yet at the same time, it might be that the discovery of a proof requires a tremendous amount of work, right? Where you have yeah. to like, so you have to have this kind of, this, this, incredible self-confidence in your own capacity to make reasonable conjectures about a mathematical object in order to do any mathematics at all. Because oftentimes you're kind of guided by like an intuition. It's a guess. Here's my theorem that I think holds of this thing. And you might have to spend, I don't know, weeks, months banging your head against the table, trying to find the proof of that theorem. And the only thing that can sustain your intellectual efforts during that time, right, um, is a kind of feeling that the theorem or some version of it must hold. Um, it's, you know, it's what, uh, what Peirce would have called like abduction in the strongest sense of the term. It's like, it's rational guesswork, but it's informed by a certain kind of like familiarity with the object that comes from having played with it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's like a kind of cast in reels sort of structure where you're like, here's my conjecture. I think it's right. <laughs> I think it's mm -hmm. right, not because I have a proof. Obviously, if I had a proof, I wouldn't need to conjecture. So I think it's right because I have a certain kind of like familiarity with the thing about which I'm conjecturing. And that familiarity with the thing is enough to support my uh, investment of all of these intellectual resources right. into trying to discover the proof. It's a really bizarre kind of intellectual activity when viewed in that yeah. way. Yeah, because it's, like, you... it's, it's informed guesswork followed by... <laughs> Uh, by, you know, by serious intellectual labor in the pursuit of trying to validate the guess. Yeah. When you tell this story or you describe this process, it makes me think of Andrew Wiles and sort mm -hmm. of locking From himself in right. his, yeah, in his attic, right. I think for like years basically, or well, I mean, he was going about and doing his regular life, but spending like all of his free time working on Fermat's last theorem. Um, right just with this right. conviction that he would solve it. And eventually he did. Yeah. And prior to the moment at which he had a proof, he had no proof, so to speak, right? <laughs> right? That his evidence right. in mathematics doesn't come in degrees, at least not in the obvious sense, right? It doesn't, it's mm -hmm. not just like you have, well, I have like in, 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 in the non-mathematical domain, we might have lots of evidence that supports a claim. Um, we just 
haven't yet found that side of, that kind of decisive test of its truth. Right. But in mathematics, it doesn't work that way. Like short of the proof, you don't have a proof, right? And so, you know, it's it's hard to talk about like gradations of evidence in mathematics. Although, I mean, on that, although Heim has also written a paper on assigning probabilities, non extremal probabilities to mathematical claims, to arithmetical claims. Hmm. Um, so there's there's a way of trying to <laughs> to import some of that graded epistemological language into the domain of um, mathematical reasoning. Now, b- before we move on a little bit, I think it is worth noting and very interesting that a lot of mathematical training, and most of mine is in math logic, but it involves sort of becoming comfortable with this process that you've just described of having to like toil away where you know there's a proof, but you don't have it yet. And so math problem sets, you might have like three or four problems for a week or something, as opposed to when you're in third grade and you have 200 multiplication problems to solve where it's just an algorithm. And the, the, well, so it's not just the, so it's not, I, I think it's not just the, uh, the amount of effort that needs to be put in to discovering a proof. So when you, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're given exam, when you're given exam questions, then suppose you're, you know, you're, 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 you're sitting a mathematical exam and the professor gives you a certain set of questions, claims or something, and you're asked to prove those claims in that context, at least you can rely on a certain pragmatic presupposition about the teacher, right. And, and, and the exam, right. That the teacher is unlikely to have given you a claim and asked you to prove it if there didn't exist a proof of the claim. Mm-hmm. Right. So you at least have that kind of like pragmatic presupposition to fall back on to justify the efforts that you put into trying to discover that proof. Right. Why would the, why would the teacher have asked me to prove this claim if there wasn't a proof to be given in real mathematics? <laughs> that is in kind of in generative, like in, in novel mathematics, where you're trying to, to, to establish new theorems, you don't have that pragmatic presupposition to go on. So, you know, what gives you the confidence to put weeks or months or in the case of whatever, you know, Andrew Bile or whatever, what years, <laughs> decades even in, into trying to pursue a proof that you don't even know exists. That's the interesting question, I think. And, and I think this idea of like, uh, of playing with an object until your conjectures become more than just guesses um, is really at the heart of it. You know, that it's, it's, a, it's an essential part of mathematical activity, that initial um, kind of acquaint, like that, 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 that coming to be acquaint, that, that, that initial process whereby you come to be acquainted with the mathematical object in a way that your mathematical conjectures can themselves, because they're yours, give you the support that you need to like really engage in this activity. And so it's a really interesting sort of epistemological issue. Yeah. Yeah. The, the point that I was making, I mean, granted, even if the problem set only has three or four problems, yeah, you know that there's a solution. But in going through that problem set, you have to become very comfortable with this process of toying around and not knowing what the proof is. But granted, this is very different from the mm-hmm. case where you don't know that there is a proof. But so I yeah. started off asking what uh, studying with Heim was like and how you got sucked into logic and the technical side of philosophy. And I thought that these yeah. things would uh, go together, but maybe, maybe it doesn't it doesn't sound like it just they were the exact same thing. But you started out in physics and then ended up, mm-hmm. though, doing largely more formal philosophy. How did, did yeah. that happen? Uh, um Uh, well, I, first of all, let me just say that, like, I, I don't actually think of myself primarily as a logician. Okay. Um, so, so my, so my entry into, into philosophy and formal philosophy wasn't through logic. Um, I didn't really study much logic until I started working with time, um, really. And even so, I, I don't consider myself like a logician in that. Uh, in that, in that sort of specialized sense of the term, my, my main interest, I, I, I entered into philosophy primarily through the philosophy of physics because that was, um, the material that I was most interested in. I mean, that's, that was my gateway drug, so to speak into, into philosophy. It was reading David Albert's books. Yeah. I was going to ask. Right. I have yeah, so David Albert was David also, and yeah, Tim he was also on Saturday. 
So he was also on my dissertation committee. So he was like one of my faculty advisors, although I had much more interaction with Heim than I did with David, um, partly because my interests moved away from the specific interest that I had in the foundations of physics towards more abstract issues and formal epistemology. Um, I guess, how did I get into it? I think, um, you know, all of this is sort of probably like rational reconstruction of a sort, because I don't know yeah. how, how you get into anything. You just like end up in it uh -huh. um, before you know it, you're like teaching it somewhere. But um, it's like, so, so there was a, there was a negative component. There was a negative pressure that came from my work in physics where I just didn't, I was taking graduate level physics courses and it wasn't satisfying the sort of intellectual needs that I felt <laughs> I had at the time, you know, solving Schrodinger's equation or something under increasingly complicated <laughs> boundary conditions. Well, it's an important thing to do, of course, but it's not like, for me, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't really addressing the intellectual needs that I felt most deeply at the time. And um, I was, I was getting more of that intellectual fulfillment by reading philosophy books and going to philosophy courses on the side, <laughs> like taking seminars on the side that I was really interested in. And, um, so I just, I, the, the shift was probably affected in that way. I think the reason it took so long for me to eventually find my way to philosophy is partly because, you know, it's an interesting, it's kind of a fact about the, the physics undergraduate curriculum. So like when you, when you study physics as an undergrad, you know, most of what you study for, let's say the first two or three years of your undergraduate education, at least in my case, most of what I studied was sort of. Uh, pre 20th century physics, you study something like what we might call like early modern physics, like Newtonian physics. Um, and it's not until your third or fourth year in a physics curriculum that you start to get exposed to some of the failures of that Newtonian physical view of the world. And um, you start to uh, be taught how modern physics attempts to sort of correct some of those failures, right? So most of what you learn as a physics student is like, what, you know, what we call like the classical Newtonian mechanical view of the world. And there's something very metaphysically satisfying about that picture of the world, <laughs> even though it's, it's not right. There's something very metaphysically satisfying about it because it's just a bunch. It presents the world to you in an incredibly coherent way. It's just a bunch of little bits of matter that are bumping into each other in accordance yeah. with certain fixed laws. And everything just follows from that, right? In more or less complicated ways. And even... For somebody who has a kind of more metaphysical uh, perspective on the world, that is, who wants more than just an account of how the world works, but like a worldview, that's pretty satisfying. You know, it can be pretty satisfying as um, like a metaphysical picture of things. Um, and then what happens is that you start to see, you know, you start to you start to see the cracks <laughs> in the Newtonian armor, so to speak. You start to see the points where it fails, right? It doesn't make sense of like how light propagates, for instance, in accordance with Maxwell's laws. And so we need some corrective to make sense of how light propagates. Um, we need a theory of special relativity, which we cover a bit later, right? It doesn't make sense of, um, well, all sorts of other things, you know, the, you know, there's the photoelectric, there are, there are all these imperfections <laughs> that start to emerge at the end of the 20th century in this classical Newtonian picture of the world that require these correctives that lead us in the direction of modern physics. So we get the special theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, quantum mechanics. And the thing is when you're first exposed to this as a physics student, they sort of come out of the blue, they're shocking. <laughs> and they don't, at least in my experience, they didn't provide me with the kind of metaphysical worldview that, um, that the, the classical picture did, you know? Um, if you, if you see what I'm saying, it's like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I have no doubt that we live in a quantum mechanical world. Like it's the best tested theory the human mind has ever conceived. Um, I have no idea what it means to live in a quantum mechanical world <laughs> or very right. little idea of what right, it means right. to live in a quantum mechanical world. I know that we do. Um, but I don't, I don't know like what that means. And when you say very, you don't know what it means, are you saying that it's, difficult to uh, reconcile your 
macroscopic reality picture with the microscopic reality picture or you are saying quite more literally that you uh, have trouble grappling with the physics um i think it goes deeper than that okay um because you know even from a classical perspective there's a certain apparent mismatch between the macroscopic and the microscopic world but you just learn to deal with that like you know I, i think the the kind of revolutions in modern physics brought in a whole host of new difficulties. It's not about reconciling the macroscopic with the microscopic. It's rather that like certain questions that we think must have answers, right. And must be answered in order for us to have a coherent conception of what the world is like. Quantum mechanics just doesn't answer like a basic question. Like what is the stuff of the world? Like what's it made up of? Like, what's the basic fundamental stuff that makes up the world? It's not so clear how to answer that question um, from a quantum mechanical point of view. You know, you could say that it's, you know, the world is just this big wave function, you know, to which the natural kind of question is like, well, a wave of what? What, what is it a wave <laughs> of? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the answer is something like, well, it's a probability amplitude. And now we're like, I don't know, I don't know what we're talking about <laughs> anymore. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I understand how you can leverage a certain theoretical account of the world into making incredibly pre- precise predictions about like the outcomes of a variety of experiments. So I have no doubt that in some sense, like the theory is, is an accurate description of the world. I just don't know what the world is like that it's accurately describing. And I think the only people who, to my mind at least, were at least were like interested in grappling with that question, were not people in physics departments, but there were people in like philosophy departments, where there were people at least who were working at the kind of intersection of philosophy and physics, maybe more philosophically minded physicists or something. And so that already suggested to me that maybe there was a different approach that philosophy was adopting towards some of these issues um, um, that, that wasn't there in standard physics. And that's something that I wanted to pursue. So that's part of what sort of moved me in that direction. That I, I wanted to to answer some of those questions. Um, I wanted to see whether or not you could do the philosophical work of attaching a coherent worldview to um, to these to these modern theories of the world, which you know I think are true, at least yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe not in their finer details, but are true by and large, and so. Issues about the measurement problem struck me as really fascinating. And um, so that's how I, I, I kind of got into philosophy. It was largely in this way. You know, I think that it's interesting. You know, one of the lessons I, I, I now feel, unfortunately, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit more skeptical than I once was <laughs> about like the possibility of, um, of doing this kind of work, of successfully prosecuting it. Um, it's not obvious to me anymore that um, it's not obvious to me anymore that there is a coherent kind of metaphysical worldview that can be attached to some of these modern theories of the world, at least not in a sense that would satisfy our like philosophical needs. Um, I think it's a really interesting revelation of 20th century physics that these two projects like come apart in a way that the project of trying to give a true account of the world, true theoretical account of the world, and the project of trying to give a coherent metaphysics. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to do the one necessarily to do the other, um, that the two kind of proceed in isolation in a way. I think that's a, that's a really interesting development um, in sort of the history of, of, of like human thought, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I probably would have originally said that um, it was just that I was more interested in these like foundational questions and they weren't satisfactorily being addressed by my continued study of physics that led me in the direction of philosophy. Now, I think um, I would describe the situation somewhat differently. Um, I think, you know, and this gets into the issue of like what the relationship is between philosophy on the one hand and say physics on the other. And um, I think it's not just a difference in subject matter or the kinds of questions that we ask or something. It's that, um, sorry, I'm going to put this. It's that um, 
the kind of reasoning that is that is like most characteristic of scientific inquiry um, is reasoning that is addressed to a certain kind of intellectual dissatisfaction that is very different in kind from the kind of intellectual dissatisfaction that prompts us to philosophize about the world. Um, I, I think that scientific inquiry is largely driven by what we might think of as like curiosity. I want to know what the world is like, hmm. right? I feel dissatisfied in the fact that I don't know what the world is like, at least within some small part of it, like within some small domain. And the kind of activity that I'm driven to do to address that gap is something that looks like scientific activity. I don't think philosophy is addressed to the same kind of intellectual dissatisfaction. Interesting. Um, yeah. So I would say, like when I think about here, let me give you, so I think, yeah. let me give you an example, maybe. So when I think about the things that I am genuinely curious about, like the things that I would just like to know because I don't know them, right? There are, things, there are aspects of the world that, that I don't know, and I would like to know uh, uh, what the world is like in those respects. There are only a few things that really, for me at least, that really like sort of immediately come to mind. Like I'm curious, for instance, about whether or not, uh, and maybe more than whether or not, the extent to which the universe is populated with extraterrestrial life. It's just a question I have. Like, I'd like to know, right? Is there extraterrestrial life in the universe? And mm -hmm. how much of it is there, right? I'm really just curious about this. It's not like a kind of, I don't find it to be a very deep philosophical question necessarily. Um, others might. But for me, it's just a point of curiosity. Like, I'm just curious. I look up at the stars and I wonder, like, is there a bunch of life out there? And if so, like, you know, um, it's a curious how, how populated? Question. Yeah, it's, it's curiosity about a factual question. And so because like the nature of my intellectual dissatisfaction takes this form that is curiosity about a factual question, I feel no inclination at all to philosophize about this. Like the only thing that I can think it is a reason that I can think of as a reasonable response to this feeling is to do science or something that looks like science. Um, for me, philosophy, the, the thing that prompts me to philosophize feels very different. It doesn't feel like curiosity about a factual question. Um, so what does it feel like? It feels like, well, I think the most characteristic example of the feeling emerges when we look at like paradoxes, right? When somebody gives me an argument that seems like it's a reasonable argument, but the argument leads me to some like absurd conclusion. The feeling of not knowing what went wrong in that argument is, is like the feeling of, and how, how do I correct things, right? That feeling is the feeling that prompts me to philosophize. Hmm. And it's just a very different feeling, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, it, it feels different. And I think what's, what's sometimes confusing about all of this is that we might express these two very different feelings by asking questions that have the same like linguistic form right so let, let me give you an example like um here's a question are we brains in a vat right are we in a simulation right maybe is the world just one big computer simulation so i think when <laughs> um so so when a kind of scientifically oriented mind asks a question like this, right? When this question rather maybe is to be understood as an expression of just curiosity about a factual matter, it leads you in one direction, right? I don't know. Are we brains in a vat? I'm curious. Might we be brains in a vat? Let's try to assess how likely it is that we're brains in a vat. Let's do some like probabilistic analysis of like the likelihood of that or something, <laughs> you know? Um, and it leads you in the direction of that kind of thinking about the problem. When philosophers ask, at, when philosophers ask the same question, like, are we brains in a vat? They're not curious about whether or not we're brains in a vat. Like, there's not curiosity about some factual yeah. question. Yeah, That's yeah. not what they're saying, right? Yeah. So it's not that at all. When philosophers say, like, uh, might we be brains in a vat? What, what they're saying is, look, 
here's a problem <laughs> that the brain in the bat scenario generates. Here's a paradox or a puzzle that it generates, right? How can it be that I can claim to know all these things about the world while at the same time not being able to rule out a possibility, namely the brain in the bat scenario, which if true would render false all of the things that I can claim to know <laughs> about the world, right? All of those things that I claim to know about the world. Like something's gone wrong here in my understanding of knowledge, in my concept of knowledge. My concept of knowledge needs rectification because it seems puzzling to me that I should be able to claim knowledge of all of these things and at the same time not be able to exclude this possibility, which if true would render all those things that I claim to know false, right? That's the philosophical problem that's raised by the brain and the bat scenario. It's yeah. not like curiosity about whether we're a brain or that. No philosopher has ever, I think, been curious about whether we're like actually brains that have had, yeah, yeah. right? You know, which is why I think a lot of this like kind of quasi scientific research into the matter where you're calculating probabilities and trying to assess how likely it is that we might be in a simulation or something. It yeah. doesn't make contact with, with most philosophers understanding of the topic, right? Of skepticism. Yeah. It doesn't like, it, it, they don't, they don't touch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, this, this reminds me of two approaches to philosophy. And I think that they, they reflect the, thoughts that you've just had very well and i wonder if you feel the same way so heim going back to heim he thinks of philosophy the goal of philosophy as uh providing insight and another professor i've i've had here at stanford his name's nadim hussein he sort of sees philosophy as untangling difficult questions and then once they're sufficiently untangled then they get dealt out to like physics or math or something like that and your notion that paradox is a good way of seeing this i think is exposed quite nicely by the sorieties paradox so we don't think that there's a, a factual question to how many grains make up a heap of sand but there is a very deep problem about vagueness here. And when we talk about the vagueness problem with the Sorites paradox, as we have been for over 2000 years, we're really untangling something very deep. And in this case, I'm, I'm not sure that it becomes a factual question. That is, <laughs> there is a factual no, I, question to be dealt out to the sciences anywhere. But yeah, it I don't does, think they're right. Mm -hmm. it, it does point to this deep distinction between factual yeah. questions and untangling, I think is another. Yeah, thing. I would, I, I think, you know, uh, of the two perspectives that you, um, that you just outlined, I think I would be more in line with Heim's perspective where the aim here is different. It's so that's, it doesn't, it's not that we do some philosophical work and that work issues in something now that has been sufficiently clarified that some other special researcher in sciences can now take it up and, and deal with it. It's, it's rather that like, these are just two different kind of ambitions, two different intellectual ambitions that we have. Um, mm -hmm. You can call it insight if you want. I don't, the, the terminology here is pretty bad because we don't, I don't think we have a rich enough like psychological vocabulary really <laughs> to describe sure. these different species of intellectual dissatisfaction in a, in a, in a kind of compelling way. Um, you know, this, so this, the sororities paradox is a good example where it doesn't look like there's anything like that's at stake factually. There are other cases of paradox where um, there's clearly nothing at stake factually because the fact of the matter is so obvious that nobody would think to deny it. You know, so like take an example of like, um, uh, you know, like like the Achilles and the tortoise sort of puzzle or paradox, mm -hmm. right? How does Achilles ever catch up with the tortoise? Maybe it's the tortoise and the hare. I don't know who's involved. I think it's Achilles and the tortoise. I think it's, a, it's Achilles. Yeah, it's Achilles and the tortoise, right? And there's this kind of puzzle that like suppose the tortoise has a bit of a head start. Right. Then how does Achilles ever catch up with the tortoise? Because certainly in order to catch up with the tortoise, Achilles has to traverse like half of the distance between himself and the tortoise first. Right. That takes a certain non-zero amount of time. Right. At which point the tortoise has moved ahead a little bit of where he was at before. So now the tortoise is ahead a little bit of where he was at before. And Achilles has to, again, traverse half of that distance first before catching up with the tortoise. Right. Uh, and, and the tortoise has moved ahead a little bit <laughs> in that amount of time. And so, you know, this kind of reasoning suggests that 
Achilles can never catch up with the tortoise. But of course, we know the fact of the matter that Achilles can catch up with the tortoise. The question is not about like, can Achilles catch up with the tortoise? Like as if it would, you know, is there extraterrestrial life in the universe? Can he in fact do it? No, of course he can do it. Everybody knows he can do it. It's obvious that he can do it. The puzzle is not about the fact because the fact is like there for us to have. The puzzle is about what's wrong with the reasoning. Where have our concepts gone astray, right? Insofar as they've led us to what is an absurd conclusion that Achilles can never catch up with the tortoise. So the work to be done now is kind of rehabilitating our concepts in such a way that we're not led to this absurdity, right? And of course, that took many years. That took thousands of years. I mean, this is like, this is what led to, to, to more sophisticated notions of continuity, change. And this is a complicated issue, right? Um, which is why, and a lot of, by the way, a lot of like mathematical, very sophisticated mathematical reasoning can go into um, solving philosophical problems too. You know, it, it's not as if just because philosophical problems are not about, um, like scientific issues or they're not scientifically well formed or something. So there can still be quite a lot of mathematics that's involved in solving them. Mathematics is just, just as at home in philosophy in my mind as it is in physics. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, an another good example of this sort of, this sort of distinction. So I think the brain and the bat example is one kind of example. Um, Another I think good example. Consciousness is another one, too. But. It could be totally, yeah. totally. So I think oftentimes what happens when like there's a kind of miscommunication between physics and philosophy, and there's these debates about to what extent physics can inform philosophy or vice versa. It's often just people are asking different questions um, under the same kind of linguistic guise, so to speak. So like, I think a, another good example is about the origins of the universe. You know, so like. I think when, um, so when someone like Leibniz posed a question like, why is there something rather than nothing, right? He wasn't asking, he wasn't indulging his curiosity as to like the origins of the universe. That, that's not what he was doing. He wasn't saying, um, I wonder how the universe got started, right? Which is presumably in its in its like factual mode a question that has to be deferred to the expertise of like I don't know cosmologists or yeah. physicists or something. But that's very clearly not the question that Leibniz was interested in. He was interested in a different kind of question, <laughs> uh, which he he sort of phrased in this language of like why is there something rather than nothing. The question he was interested in asking is the kind of philosophical puzzle that's raised by a question that that looks like that is like how could there even be something like an explanation of everything of the universe like how, how could there even be such a thing because surely the explanation has to draw on resources that go beyond in some way the thing that it purports to explain but if the thing that it purports to explain is everything like the universe in its entirety right um like what could it even mean to give an explanation of such a thing? Right. Um, that, that's the kind of philosophical puzzle I think that Leibniz was trying to grapple with. How, how could there be like an account of the universe in its entirety? Because wouldn't it have to be the case that the universe comprehends that very account insofar as it is by definition, everything that is. And so like, can we make any progress on this? Or is this just like an insoluble question? Is, is this just kind of conceptually insoluble question, right? Why is there something rather than nothing? Um, that's the philosophical form of the question. It's not about cosmology. Or it's not about like the early origins of the universe, which is why, again, I think most philosophers are by and large not interested by those, those kinds of issues. Um, mm -hmm. Even though it looks like they're asking kind of superficially, it looks like they're asking these kinds of cosmological questions about how the universe came to be. What they're really asking is like, what would the form of an explanation have to look like in order for it to be an explanation of the universe of all that is? Um, that's a, that's a very different kind of question, you know? Yeah. Now, Getting back again to the question that I asked you when we, we started <laughs> off this conversation. So now I take it that 
you went from physics to philosophy in the first place. I mean, this is um, a, a, a cheap, like one sentence summary of what we've been talking about this entire time, but it's because you preferred or were more intellectually stimulated by the way philosophic yeah. philosophy approached certain questions right. than I, the way physics yeah. did. Now, why then did you turn or specialize, at least when you were working with Heim, in formal philosophy? Is it because you felt that formal philosophy maybe gave you a more rigorous tool set for dealing with these, this way of answering the questions that you found more stimulating? Um, I don't think that it was as explicit a decision. Right. It's rational reconstruction. Like no, yeah, but no, yeah, but even like, it's not that I, I decided at some point, like, oh, you know, let me do philosophy in a formal way. I, I think, you know, I think a formal philosophical approach is in a way like it's the natural approach to take. Uh, well, it, it's not the natural approach to take. It's one natural approach to take when you're focused specifically on the kinds of problems that I was describing as the problems that give rise to kind of philosophizing in the first instance. So take the Sorites paradox, right? So the Sorites paradox emerges from a certain kind of argument, right? That's given where the idea is something like, suppose you have uh, a, a big heap of sand, <laughs> right? This constitutes a heap. But then the puzzle is, but surely, you know, its status as a heap is unaffected by the addition or removal of a single grain of sand. Um, in which case it looks like we can just chain together consecutively, right? Uh, a large enough number of single, uh, sorry, removals of single grains of sand until we reach a point where um, the thing that we have is clearly not a heap anymore. And so something has gone wrong right in the reasoning so it feels to me and i don't think this is like i don't think this is this doesn't feel to me like an explicit methodological preference as much as like the thing that one would naturally do when confronted mm -hmm. by like this kind of issue sit down and try to figure out like what the reasoning is try to write it down precisely so try to write down precisely what the reasoning is right um that automatically sort of moves you in the direction of giving a kind of like logical analysis of the reasoning. What I mean by a logical analysis of the reasoning here is like separate out like the parts of the reasoning that you take to just be sort of formally valid and acceptable and the parts of the reasoning that you take to constitute sort of material assumptions that are, um, that are involved in deriving the fallacious conclusion, right? So that process of analysis where you say, okay, there's like, here's a bad argument. It's getting me to a bad place, right? Um, how do I correct it? How do I rehabilitate it? How do I see what went wrong? I think the natural thing to do is to try to formalize the argument. Yeah. yeah. It's to try to, to formalize it. And what I mean by formalize it is just that. It's like, it's to separate out like the parts of the reasoning that you're going to treat as given or as unobjectionable. And then the parts of the reasoning that you're going to treat as like material assumptions whose truth you could question, perhaps, right? So in this case, for instance, in the Sorites paradox case, um, there, there are lots of different avenues here, but you know, you might think like, so a material assumption, a starting point of the reasoning is something like, um, for all numbers n, if, I don't know, a, a, an aggregation of n grains of sand constitutes a heap, then an aggregation of n minus one grains of sand constitutes a heap. This is like a material assumption. Yeah. Right. And I might write it out as like, you know, a universally quantified expression in the language of first order logic, but that's not important that you might use that kind of logical terminology. It's that you want to identify that as an assumption in the argument, something that, that you could question perhaps whose truth you could sort of interrogate. Putting it in the language of first order logic is just to say like, oh, okay, I'm going to take for granted reasoning in first order logic as something that is like acceptable. I'm not going to question that. <laughs> I'm going to question the assumptions that go into deriving the bad conclusion in first order logic. Right? So that's like what it means to formalize the reasoning.
It's just yeah. to separate out the form from the matter, so to speak. And then, of course, you might later think, ah, but maybe the problem isn't so much with the material assumptions. Maybe the problem is with the logic, <laughs> and I need to, you know, I need to qualify the logic. In fact, Heim's own solution to the Sorides paradox is this kind of right. solution: vagueness right? and contextual logic. Right, where he where he modifies the logic, right, mm -hmm. so that you. You're not allowed to chain together arbitrarily many conditionals in this way. There's a there's a limit, a contextually specified limit to how many conditionals you can chain together, right? Um, so I guess my point is to answer your question is that for me at least I, I don't feel like the use of formal methods in philosophy is like a choice, right? I feel like it's 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 a natural response to um to to philosophical activity that takes as its starting point these kinds of examples of paradox uh i, I think when you when you start with paradoxes and you think this is like the thing that this is a good place to start <laughs> when you do philosophy I, I think you're naturally going to like move in the direction of a more formal approach that's sort of my way of thinking about it. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't think that I don't like the label formal philosophy because it suggests that it's like, you know, it's like, it's the, it's the bringing to bear of these like formal methods from mathematics or something into the domain of philosophy where mm -hmm. they, you know, either rightly or wrongly belong. I just don't think that I think any, any serious mind who is really grappling with the sororities paradox is going to very quickly be led into something that looks like formal philosophy and that falls into that heading. I, I would be, uh, um, I would be impressed to see <laughs> like uh, a, a really sophisticated and detailed discussion of the Sorides paradox that avoids an appeal to formalism. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't think you can do it. I think the kind of analysis, which is just sort of, which is natural to the study of these kinds of problems is one which kind of brings yeah. formal stuff into the, into the picture. So uh, thus far in our discussion, I think we've been presupposing sort of what formalism is or what logic is, but within philosophy, even there are lots of different attitudes or answers um, yeah. or perspectives on what logic is. So some people, I've heard uh, might construe logic to be like the rules of the universe, though I would think of uh, physics as a, a much better candidate for that sort of thing. And when I think of logic or maybe more particularly of symbolic logic, my gut instinct is to view it quite broadly as a field concerned with exploring the possibilities of systematized reasoning though that's a little bit um vague but if someone were to ask you what logic is as i suppose i'm doing right now uh, how do you answer them and how does it relate maybe to the process of formalization as we were just discussing in regard to the sorieties paradox i mean i guess i would say that um I guess I would say that I, I tend to think of, of logic um, in a very broad and encompassing sense. So logic is the study of, of the norms that govern the activity of reasoning broadly construed, where, you know, reasoning isn't just limited to the kind of reasoning that one does in mathematics, okay. but um, uh, the kind of reasoning that, um, we do, for instance, when we perform a statistical analysis, let's say, and draw, um, uh, sort of test a statistical hypothesis against the data. Um, so I think there's a logic there. there there's logic that, that's there. I think it's, um, sort of when we draw inductive conclusions about the future based on our observations of the past, this is a kind of reasoning. So it falls within the purview of logic. When we employ even like subconscious heuristics in thinking about the world, there might be a logic here. Um, so it's just, I mean, broadly speaking, it's kind of the, the, the normative investigation of 
um, reasoning in, in its broadest, in, in the broadest possible sense of, of the term. I, I think you could go even further and say that really what logic is, is something like this, a study of, I'm not unsympathetic to this view of, of, of logic. It's like a study of, uh, of the, the fundamental forms of cognition, of human cognition, um, the most basic forms of human cognition. You know, I think that this is, um, this is how like Kant used the term logic, I think. Um, but this is what he meant by the term. And it, it has, I think that has like, um, that, that kind of usage of the term is, is, is reasonable. Um, you know, I think like, you know, maybe it's useful to, um, I, I think Kant is a useful figure here for thinking about the significance of logic for philosophy insofar as Kant himself viewed at least like one of his major innovations in philosophy, right? One of his great improvements over philosophy as it had been done in the past was to say that um, instead of trying to identify the fundamental structure of the world by sort of directly positing sort of metaphysical categories, maybe in the way that Aristotle did, um, Kant's suggestion was to sort of derive our metaphysical categories, derive our metaphysics from logic, right? That is to start with a certain conception of what the fundamental modes of cognition are, <laughs> and then to see what kind of structures are like implicated in those modes of cognition. And Kant thought this was the right starting point for philosophy. I'm kind of sympathetic, at least the right starting point for metaphysics. I'm kind of sympathetic to this view. I don't agree with Kant's logic, so I don't agree with his metaphysics. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea <laughs> that um, that uh, this is the right way to think about things um, is is probably right. I think that in a way, you know, so Kant has this table of the forms of judgment. These are the basic forms of logical inference, the fundamental forms of logical inference that can't be further reduced, right? So like categorical syllogisms in the mode Barbara, this is like a fundamental form of logical inference that can't be further reduced. Um, he has a variety of other kinds of uh, modes of inference that he thinks are, are fundamental. Um, and then we ask like, what kind of structures in the world are sort of built into reasoning of this sort? That's our starting point. for med Those are our metaphysical categories. That's our starting point for speculating about about the fundamental structure of the world. So that approach where we kind of take, uh, we take a study of cognition, of the structure of human cognition as primary, and then use that in some way, leverage that, that view into an account of the fundamental structure of the world. Um, I think I'm, I'm broadly sympathetic to that. And I, you know, to, to view logic as like that kind of investigation, I think is, um, is right in a way. So, you know, that kind of maneuver in Kant to, to place logic before metaphysics and not the other way around, I think is, is, is salutary. I think it's a good thing for, for philosophy. Um, it means that like, you know, the, 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 that the principal science of philosophy is not metaphysics as much as it is, as it is something like, I don't know, metacognition or metapsychology or something. That's where philosophy begins. Um, so I think, uh, of course, most people don't want to think about logic as being that closely related to human psychology. <laughs> like many people want to think about logic, uh, at least post Frege, many people want to think about logic as being about like the structure of thought in its abstraction from say human psychological processes. Um, I don't think about it that way. I think that logic is like, it, it's, it's part of, um, the, the logic is, it does involve human cognition um, in a very essential way. Um, I think part of the reason that the kind of psychological aspects of logic uh, have sort of been lost to us, that it's essential connection to human cognition have been lost to us um, is partly because Frege himself was specifically interested in like a kind of human reasoning that is like psychologically not that interesting, namely mathematics. So in mathematics, there aren't a bunch of different like psychological attitudes that one has to take towards propositions. It's pretty much assertion 
and uh, and denial, right? Maybe there's a kind of like hypothetical assertion that's needed to understand conditional reasoning in mathematics, a kind of suppositional reasoning. But it's like psychologically not that rich and complex. Uh, and so insofar as logic gets principally associated with mathematical reasoning, the psychological aspects of the subject uh, are easy to ignore because they're not that interesting. This is why, you know, Frege has like one judgment stroke. <laughs> That's it. It's like, boom, assertion. And there's a kind of suppositional reasoning in Frege's logic, uh, which also has to be made sense of, but that's about it, right? Um, and that's because in mathematics, there aren't a lot of, like I said, there aren't a lot of like complicated psychological attitudes that one has to adopt towards propositions in order for the reasoning to go through. Um, uh, but I think that's just an artifact of, of logics in the 20th century, having been so closely associated with specifically mathematical reasoning. Mm -hmm. And that if we understood logic in the broader sense of just the study of reasoning more generally, it would be incredibly difficult to ignore the kind of the psychological or cognitive components of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I don't know that this is an answer to the question. It's a hard question. What is logic? Is. But I guess I would say something like logic is the study of the fundamental structure of human cognition. You mentioned as soon as I asked this question uh, that reasoning is not limited to mathematics and that logic is concerned with the norms of reasoning. And you, I mean, referred to a number of different logics and different philosophers thoughts on logic. So I, I mean, this already kind of reveals your position about logical pluralism, plural, logical pluralism. Uh, the question of whether there are multiple valid logics, I think that's the, the way of very briefly explicating that term. Mm -hmm. But how do you make sense of the plur pluralist monist debate in logic and the position that there is like one true logic? Uh, because from the pluralist perspective, the question almost seems to like not make sense that there could just be one true logic if logic is just ways of reasoning, because clearly we reason differently. I mean, even with, within mathematics, there's intuitionistic logic, there's classical logic, there's paraconsistent, there are different ways of reasoning that everybody can grapple with. So it's hard to really understand what it could mean to say that there's only one true logic. So I guess I would say that, um, I guess I would say that um, I'm not a pluralist in the sense that I think um, when we when when we look at a system of logic, what we're looking at is just sort of one set of rules for right reasoning, and that there's nothing more that can be said about whether one set of rules versus another is right. I, okay. I think that we can, in fact, engage in that kind of like normative critique. So there's more um, nuance to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more, when I said that the, when I said that logic when I said that logic is like more encompassing than just mathematical reasoning, what I meant is that, you know, reasoning is not just mathematical reasoning. There's all sorts of other modes yeah. of reasoning which have their own yeah. logics. Now, is there one true logic or are there many? Um, that's a complicated question. I think I, I tend to be, uh, I guess what I would describe myself as is something like a kind of methodological pluralist about logic. That is, um, if you go back to like the Sorites paradox example, right? You could be a sort of hardliner, let's say, about um, like first order quantification of logic. And you could say first order quantification of logic describes the rules of right reasoning. And so any analysis of the Sorites paradox, which is going to be convincing, is one which takes for granted the validity or the correctness, let's say, of all valid inferences in first order quantification of logic, right? And that puts constraints on the kinds of analyses that you can give of the paradox. For instance, you can't go Heim's route, which right. proposes a different kind of logic, a contextual logic. Um, which regards certain inferences valid in, in, in first order quantification logic as invalid, right? Maybe because they, you know, the chains are too long or something. You can't go that route. So my view is that we should be very open-minded when it comes to analyzing these paradoxes 
about the logical systems that we employ. We should be very open to the idea that it might be that the only satisfactory resolution to a philosophical problem is one which requires a substantive change in our logical assumptions right, about what arguments are valid and which ones are not. And so from a methodological point of view, I think I am uh, very pluralistic in the sense that I think oftentimes like the best solutions to philosophical problems come from adopting a certain attitude of open-mindedness with respect to underlying systems of logic, which ones mm -hmm. we should employ. And I think it's, it's, uh, I mean, the kind of the other side of the coin here is to say that I think it's a, it is a, it is a species of dogmatism to insist that there is one system of logic and that analyses of all issues have to, have to be analyses within that system. You know, I think this was the problem with like logical positivism that it fixed its logic and required analyses to be done in the logic. Right. Um, as opposed to being open-minded about the fact that this is a kind of, we have to fit two things at once here. <laughs> like the logic itself is something we're discovering in the process of the analysis. Right. So in that sense, I'm, I'm like a methodological pluralist. I, I think it's, it is, it is wrong to say this is the true logic. And if you can't analyze a concept in this logic, it means that the concept is like incoherent or nonsensical. You know, I feel like there's a kind of new uprising, a new movement along these lines uh, where many philosophers now are kind of doing metaphysics in this style where what they're doing is they're kind of fixing the logic. Uh, in this case, it's not f first order quantificational logic or something. <laughs> it's higher order modal logic, right? Which is all the new rage, but it's still saying this is the true logic and concepts live or die, rise or fall in accordance with the extent to which they can be successfully analyzed in this framework. From a methodological point of view, I think that is not the right approach to philosophy. Um, but that being said, I do think that we can interrogate a system of logic's value as compared with, say, other systems of logic by considering the extent to which that system of logic yields successful analyses of our philosophical problems. Mm -hmm. So I think first order quantification of logic is a very, very powerful tool for analyzing a certain kind of human reasoning, let's say mathematical reasoning, almost to the point at which I would say that like it is the logic of mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it has been so successful in capturing that aspect of human reasoning. And it's a non-trivial thing. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's a shame that we like, that we kind of have lost sight of how impressive an accomplishment this is that, you know, so much of what we call mathematical reasoning can be captured within, you know, a, a, a first order theory of sets. It's a remarkable thing. It's, it really is an amazing achievement, right? Which is why I'm opposed to like teaching logic to students in a way that just takes it for granted that everything can be analyzed in set theory. It's like, that's a hard earned <laughs> accomplishment, right? And you shouldn't just like present it as if it's, it's, it's obvious or trivial. So anyway, so I think it, it, so there can be victories here when it comes to competing systems of logic. Certain systems of logic can show themselves to be superior to others. Um, for the purposes of, of like analyzing a certain class of philosophical issues or analyzing a certain set of, of concepts. But I think from a methodological point of view, it's really important that we be open-minded about this, <laughs> that, that we not be hardliners about mm -hmm. our logic, you know, because oftentimes we can discover that, that our systems of logic fail in certain ways. They don't provide us with satisfactory explanations of problems, but we're only going to know by trying to work it out. Right. Mm -hmm. We're only going to be know by trying to work it out. So, um, so that's broadly my attitude, yeah. Something I'd like to touch on, I don't know, briefly or not briefly, though, is the distinction between logic and metalogic. Right. And you maybe you don't think this falls into this 
this um, distinction. But you mentioned that first order logic captures mathematical reasoning. Uh, a large part of it, yeah. Yeah, a large part of it. And I wonder if what you're saying is, so if you look at a, a typical sort of informal mathematical proof, mm -hmm. there exists a formal proof. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, we might make that thesis. There exists a formal per proof that is rigorized in first order logic. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Or if you're saying that even when a mathematician is carrying out or doing mathematics in an intuitionistic system, they are still reasoning sort of f a step back in uh, classical logic, or if they're doing some mathematics with a, a three-valued logic, they still, the mathematician is still reasoning in um, like a, a two-valued logic, like classical logic, if that's what you're saying. Um, oh. So I don't want to make a claim that there is a kind of like, I don't want to make a claim that there is a sub processing unit in the mind of a mathematician, right? Which is sort of processing the informal proofs that the mathematician gives in some, you know, kind of assembly language of first order logic with some set theory. Um, that's not what I, I want to say. Um, what I want to say is something like, um, so in giving their informal proofs, mathematicians are sort of intuitively acting in accordance with a set of, of kind of informal principles of right reasoning, informal rules of right reasoning. Um, the match between the rules of right reasoning that are guiding them in, um, you know, sort of judging the validity or invalidity of proofs, um, is an imperfect approximation to the formal system of uh, logic, which might underlie that reasoning. So the relation of like underlying here between like the system of logic itself and the informal determinations of when a proof is a proof is an imperfect one, right? So it might be that the system of logic itself dictates that certain modes of reasoning are not right, um, that the mathematician would informally judge to be correct. Um, and it might be uh, that it determines certain modes of reason to be correct, which the informal intuition, you know, thinks are invalid or something. So there can be a, a slight mismatch in terms of the, the determination of, of, of the rightness of the reasoning um, when made by the low level system and the high level system. There's a close enough fit, let's say, between the two um, for uh, and, 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 and both levels are kind of intuitive enough kind of on their own as standards of right reasoning to warrant the mathematician in saying, ah, so I'm going to defer to this normative standard, right? It is my normative standard in the sense that I'm going to accept as valid only those proofs, which can in fact be like formulated in this framework. Right, as valid inferences. So there's a kind of give and take here. I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, it, it might seem like a mystery why there should be any such system like this, right? Um, I suppose. Um, you know, there's a couple of things to just keep in mind here. So one is that I don't think actually that much of mathematical reasoning involves like performing inferences in a deductive system in this way. Like for all the reasons we talked about earlier, mathematical reasoning is really complex. A lot of it is playing with things and like 
the determination of something as a valid proof or as a good proof in mathematics is um uh is only a small part of mathematics it's only a small part of mathematical reasoning right um but also you know the kind of reasoning that's done in mathematics to translate it into first order quantificational logic it's not that it's not that weighty a translation you know um like a lot of the a lot of the concepts that are fundamental to first order logic have a more or less explicit formulation in the informal proofs given by mathematicians, right? So like quantificational talk, <laughs> quantificational talk is all over mathematics, right? Right. So, so the fact that the logic that underlies mathematics should be a kind of quantificational logic is perhaps not surprising. Um, what I think is a little bit more surprising uh, is that the various concepts that mathematicians have been are sort of naturally inclined to invoke in the context of their reasoning. So like functions and relations and, you know, these other sorts of things um, that they can all be captured by a fairly simple um, set of principles governing a single kind of object, namely sets. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's a pretty interesting result. Right. The ontology of mathematics turns out to be so simple. So, <laughs> understatement. Yeah. 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 It's an understatement. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting result. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't actually know like what I want to say about, you know, the, is there like a, like a set theory sub processor in the mind of the mathematician or something? I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not even, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I would be hesitant to say that, but um, who knows? You know, subprocessors are complicated. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So moving moving on a little bit then, you've not only worked in contemporary logic, I mean, you have papers there and some with Heim, but also the history of logic, as you, you've already indicated. But returning, I guess, sort of to my question about pluralism, you mentioned that you would more, be more comfortable classifying yourself as a methodological pluralist when it comes to logic. Has logic played notably different roles in philosophy at different times? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I think it certainly has. Uh, I think I was mentioning some of this. Yeah. Um, I was mentioning some of this when I was describing, um, you know, Kant's specific use of logic and his attempt to kind of ground his metaphysical categories in reflection on um, uh, on the kind of basic forms of right. cognition. Or um, yeah, I, I think it has. Um, you know, I don't think there is... Uh, so... Um, uh, so what exactly do I want to say about this? I mean, I, I think so. There's yeah. You know, so in the in the twentieth century, logic has played like a really important role in um, sort of trying to investigate and better understand the foundations of mathematics. So that is a specific application of logic, right? And it's yielded all sorts of very interesting results um, that from the perspective of like the philosopher of mathematician, uh, sorry, the philosopher of mathematics, like are very stimulating philosophically. So all the incompleteness results and those kinds of results are, are like part of how logic has been developed in the 20th century. I think um, that specific application of logic to um, this foundational project in the philosophy of mathematics is, um, is a relatively recent development like it's it's one specific way in which logic has been used but if you look at the you know if you look at the history of logic um prior to the 20th century let's say just use that as a as a as a, as a reasonable cutoff point um you'll find that it's it, it has always been viewed as 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 a more copious subject matter than just having to deal with like deduction and mathematics you know so if you look at a logic textbook um if you look at any logic textbook from the 19th century um, one really interesting thing that you're going to discover, right, is that 
almost all of those textbooks include a discussion of the topic of probability. Hmm. That is, probability was understood as part of logic. Uh, hmm. um, prior to the 20th century, I mean, of course, there are 20th century philosophers who have also tried to investigate probability from a kind of logical perspective, Heim he being one of them, but um, others as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so it, that's not a new thing. That's that that's there even in in in, in like in in the older tradition. Um, so if you look at, for instance, Boole's investigations into the general laws of thought, you find that there is a discussion of probability there. Um, it's already there. It's understood to be part of logic um, from its inception, from the inception of 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 sort of the concept of probability as a mathematically precise notion, um, it was generally viewed as something which belonged to the province of logic. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, I don't know that logic has been used in different ways in philosophy. I suppose it's been used in different ways in philosophy, but certainly like what we think of as the subject matter of logic has shifted. It's grown and shrunk. It's expanded and, and contracted. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't. Again, I, I'm not sure that that's. Uh, I'm not sure that that's an answer to the question, but it's. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think yeah. it's definitely we're getting in the direction that I want to go. So maybe okay. a few case studies in the history of logic would be <sighs> illuminating. So you mentioned to me that you're currently working on peripatetic propositional logic, and yeah, maybe first first off we should start with what was the peripatetic school. And how did they conceive of and maybe use logic in their philosophy? Yeah, it's very interesting. So the so um, so the history of logic is um, is sort of is interesting in that um, it's sort of characterized by two very distinct strands in its development. So there's one strand through the history of logic, which views logic as fundamentally about um, propositions, right? And compound propositions, and how we reason from compound propositions to other compound propositions by appealing to semantic features of the constituent propositions that make up those compounds, basically propositional logic. So this tradition in the history of logic, which takes propositional logic as fundamental, basically traces back to the Stoics, right? Um, the other tradition in logic uh, is um, the tradition which traces back to Aristotle and sees logic um, as fundamentally a logic of, of like terms or concepts rather than a logic of propositions. That is the fundamental unit of logical significance for Aristotle was um, the term or the concept, right? And so what logic deals with are not compound propositions, but rather simple propositions expressing predicative relations between terms, right? So we might say one concept is predicated of another concept. And what does that mean um, about other predication relations between concepts, right? So there's this like tradition in the history of logic, which views logic principally as, as, as the kind of logic of terms. And there's this other tradition, which sees it primarily as like a logic of propositions. Um, so when I when you know when you asked about what the peripatetic school of logic is, it's kind of the school of logic which thinks that um, that the term based approach to the subject is primary or fundamental, and the propositional stuff is like of secondary interest, right? It's not that important. Um, so how does this manifest in like philosophical differences that are of interest? Right. Um, so one important difference between like one important feature of um, peripatetic propositional logic that marks it as interestingly different from um, from from stoic propositional logic uh, has to do with how how peripatetic logicians thought of conditionals. Like what are conditionals? If P, then Q. So what are you saying when you say something like if P, then Q? Right. Uh, on one view, when you uh, assert a conditional like if P then Q, you're just asserting a compound proposition. You're saying something about the world, right? It has truth conditions, let's say. The truth conditions needn't be the truth conditions of the material conditional. 
But at any rate, when you express a conditional claim, you're making like a statement about the world. Um, the peripatetics had a very different view, um, a view that has like, uh, it bears a certain resemblance to sort of contemporary theories of conditional assertion, right? Um, where when you say if P then Q, like you're not, you're not making a claim about the world. <laughs> you're making a conditional claim about the world. What I'm saying is Q on the condition of P, mm -hmm. right? So to assert a conditional for the peripatetics is less like making some categorical statement about what the world is like and more like signing on to some kind of contractual arrangement whereby if I accept the truth of the antecedent to the conditional, then I'm contractually obligated to accept its consequence. Right. Um, and that's the function that conditionals have um, in logic. Um, so there are all sorts of interesting differences then between these two ways of thinking about conditionals. So if you think of conditionals as um, sort of just making claims about the world, then presumably there should be no difficulty in sort of nesting conditionals to form more complex conditionals, taking a conditional and using it as the antecedent in some other more complicated conditional. Um, there's no problem with that because after all, a conditional itself is just a claim about the world. So why shouldn't I be able to conditionalize on that claim, so to speak, right? Um, and so you get a kind of rich recursive logic of conditionals that you can study. The peripatetics, um, didn't think of conditionals this way. They don't recurse. Um, a conditional is formed by taking two claims about the world and putting them together in this way where I say, if the one claim holds, then the other claim holds. But that claim itself is not a statement about the world. And so I can't take the conditional itself and use it as the antecedent in some, um, in some further conditional. So I'm only dealing with these kind of simple conditionals, if you will, uh, that, that relate non-conditional expressions. And so it makes the peripatetic logic of conditionals, like really, it's, it seems very basic and simple, um, but there's still like a coherent logic of conditionals that can be attributed to them. Um, and so uh, when I say I'm writing this paper on peripatetic propositional logic, basically the, what, I'm, what I'm arguing in this, in this work is like, uh, and this is, this is um, joint work with a colleague of mine, Marco Malink at NYU, um, who's really like the expert in ancient logic here. <laughs> um, so what I'm arguing for here is that there's this conception of, um, there's this kind of commonly held conception uh, of categorical logic that it just kind of ignores propositional logic. You know, propositional logic was a later development. And some people criticize Aristotle for presupposing propositional logic and developing his theory of the categorical syllogism without actually formalizing it. Hmm. Um, but in fact, the right way to view it is that he has a system of propositional logic. It's a coherent system of propositional logic. It's just one which renders propositional logic like not that interesting. Um, it's, 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 it's of secondary importance, uh, really. Uh, so like, like another aspect of, of peripatetic propositional logic is that they don't countenance conjunctions of propositions. Um, because from the peripatetic perspective, the conjunction of two propositions is in itself like a new proposition. Um, it's just asserting the two propositions, if you see what I'm saying. It's just kind of like putting them together. So the idea that there's this, like, this law of logic, conjunction elimination or something, where we go from the conjunction of P and Q to the conclusion that P, right? Um, for the peripatetics, it's like, this is not reasoning at all, <laughs> because in asserting the conjunction of P and Q, you're just asserting P and Q, right? So there's no inference to be drawn from P and Q to P. They would just say, that's a, you know, this is just like a, a circular argument or something. Um, and so they have a very different attitude towards the significance of propositional logic. Basically, they don't think it's that interesting, but they do have a system of, um, of propositional logic, which is itself internally coherent. It's much weaker than classical logic. It turns out to be the first degree fragment of multiplicative linear logic, but that's a, that's a different, uh, that's, a, that's a more technical point. Um, but it's really, the real debate here is about how we should think about conditional claims. Mm -hmm. Are conditional claims claims about the world or are they not, right? When we make a conditional assertion, are we making an unconditional assertion of a conditional truth? Or are we doing something different? 
right? Is, is the mode of assertion different? Um, are we rather asserting the consequent of the conditional on the condition that the antecedent is true? Where that kind of conditional assertion is just a different mode of assertion than the unconditional assertions that are involved in straightforward statements of fact. So that's kind of what the debate is about. Um, yeah. That's what the debate is about. I know that's that's getting into the weeds of that specific debate, but... Yeah, no, that that's fine. I, I have a more broader a broader question though now are the peripatetics in general i mean in in so much as they're interested in logic are they concerned primarily with creating some sort of formal system in the way that contemporary logicians are or is logic for them more of a practical tool that they're working on honing for metaphilosophical purposes like in that they wish to use it in their philosophy to argue better, because that's an interesting aspect of ancient logic that yeah. that I think has been lost today, and then we don't seriously study like forms of fallacious reasoning, for example, in a contemporary logic course. Or are they interested in something like even more practical, like l using logic to improve uh, their rhetorical abilities? Yeah, I mean, so it's definitely true that. Um, that ancient logic, and specifically logic as it's developed in the peripatetic school, is uh, was, was sort of principally understood as a part of um, the theory of argumentation understood in the kind of rhetorical sense of the term, right? Like, um, like valid arguments um, uh, for Aristotle, or, or rather what he called syllogisms, Right, were not just arguments whose uh, which had the property that the truth of their premises entailed the truth of the conclusion, but were also arguments which, in some way, sort of carried effective rhetorical force. Right. So, um, uh, so for instance, just to take an example, um, like an argument in the form modus ponens, right. Um, for the peripatetic logician, this is like not really a valid argument um, because uh, if you've accepted the antecedent of the conditional phi, let's say, or P, and you've also accepted the conditional of P then Q, well, what it means to accept the conditional of P then Q is to say, I'm going to accept Q if I've accepted P. So to accept both P and if P then Q is already to accept Q, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's, no, there's nothing left to do. There's no, there's no productive maneuver here that carries any like rhetorical force, right? That forces the reasoner to accept something that they wouldn't otherwise accept. And so it's definitely true for the ancient logicians um, in the peripatetic school that logic has this kind of rhetorical function. It's a part of the theory of rhetoric. It's, I mean, for Aristotle, it's more like a part of the theory of explanation. Um, you know, so this is why Aristotle, for instance, precludes circular arguments from his logic, right? Um, uh, an argument in which the conclusion appears among the premises for Aristotle is not a good argument. It's not a valid argument. It's not a syllogism. Now, there might be a sense in which the argument is valid, right, in the contemporary sense of validity, where if we think about validity as like necessary truth preservation, a circular argument can have the property that if the premises are all true, then the conclusion has to be true as well. In fact, it does have that property, right? Um, but it's not a good argument for Aristotle. It's not, it's not a logically valid argument. And so historians of logic can, you know, there's, there's disputes about this. You might think that Aristotle first has like a formal system in the modern sense of the term where valid arguments are picked out as being those which are uh, sort of necessarily truth preserving. The conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. Um, and then he makes kind of rhetorical restrictions picking out from among those valid arguments, which ones are the rhetorically effective ones, right? So you could have the view that there's this kind of two layer structure to Aristotle's theory, where we have the, the logic itself, which is just about necessary truth preservation on a certain, uh, on a, like on a certain semantic account of what the propositions mean. And then beyond that, there's a separate theory of which arguments, which valid arguments are like the rhetorically persuasive ones. Um, I actually think that's not that, that kind of division between valid arguments and rhetorically persuasive ones is not one 
that is um, that is uh, that is really there in the text of Aristotle. Um, that is, I think Aristotle thinks that you know that logic is the study of rhetorically persuasive arguments. <laughs> it's mm. arguments that are either rhetorically persuasive or maybe are explanatory in some other way. Um, logic is a part of the theory of explanation. You know, um, it's tempting to think that logic comes before explanation because the prior analytics where Aristotle develops his theory of logic comes before the posterior analytics where he develops his theory of explanation. But there's pretty good sort of historical evidence to think that, um, that Aristotle wrote the prior analytics, um, partly like to clarify a certain feature of the posterior analytics that he thought required um, a more a more detailed exposition. And so in terms of the temporal ordering of the two texts and how they how they figured in his mind, the posterior analytics, despite its name, might have come first. So the theory of explanation might have come first and the theory of logic was developed as a, as a kind of um, exposition of a certain part of that theory. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very different way of thinking about logic than how we think about it today. Mm -hmm. Where logic is more, it's less about the act of explanation, right? This kind of performance where we're trying to explain to somebody why something is true. And it's more about this kind of abstract relationship that obtains between, you know, I don't know, <laughs> these entities in the third realm or something, these contents. The third right? realm. <laughs> the third yeah. realm. These like yeah. these these meanings or whatever. Right. Um, which is our in which is our unfortunate inheritance, I think, from Frego. Hmm. Unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah. Well, another case study that is very much worth going into you mentioned Leibniz earlier around the time we were talking about Kant and you've yeah. also just mentioned Marco Malink well the two of you have done I mean some very important work on Leibniz and his logic and what quite generally was Leibniz's interest in logic and my understanding is he was a very important precursor to the logical developments in the 19th and no, yeah, in the 19th century. Yeah. I mean, I think Leibniz, so in the history of logic, I think Leibniz um, figures as um, a precursor to, um, to, uh, to much of the work that was done in the 19th century, specifically like kind Boole. of work in algebraic logic. Yeah. yeah cool. So it's, it's, um it's pretty clear. And, um, it's pretty clear that Leibniz has uh, like an axiomatization of the theory of Boolean algebras already. This is two, you know, 250 years before Boole. So wow. um, he was a so guy. He huh? has, yeah. So he has a complete theory of Boolean algebras. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not in the standard signature. So the, the reason it's very diff it's, it's not easy to, the reason it's not easy to identify um, as, as an account of Boolean algebras um, is that, um, Leibniz uses a non-standard signature. So the way that we typically formulate the, the, the theory of Boolean algebras now is um, in uh, a, a signature in which the structures that we're studying have like um, various kind of um, operators that we take for. So there's a there's like a meet operator, a join operator. Yeah. Uh, I think signature um, is sufficiently a term of art that it could do with an yeah. explication. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So. Um, so it's a different signature. <laughs> so he formulates it in a different way using a different signature. And so it's not as, as obviously the theory of Boolean algebras, but it, but it is in fact, um, it is in fact just that. What's interesting though about Leibniz, for me at least, what's most interesting about Leibniz as a logician is not so much his own system of logic, um, which isn't that different than like the, like than the, than, than, the algebraic systems of logic developed in the 19th century. What's more interesting to me in, in, in thinking about Leibniz's logic is the way in which um, Leibniz's logic informed uh, many aspects of his metaphysics. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, so Leibniz starts off, if you, if you read some of his earlier writings in logic, they're really just technical writings in logic. He's trying to develop basically... Um, a theory of analytic containment, a logic for analytic containment, what it means for one concept to contain another analytically. And he explores various theories of analytic containment <laughs> and he kind of plays with them. 
and to contain systems. to contain something analytically means I'm assuming it has something to do with definitions, but I haven't heard that mm -hmm. phrase before. Yeah, for Leibniz, it means something like definitions. Okay. Um, it means that if you so one concept analytically contains another. If when you uh, replace that concept with its fully explicated definition, you find the the other concept like somewhere in that definition. It's literally like like the concept contained appears in, is contained in, like almost myriologically, is a part of um, the definition of the concept that contains it. So maybe I should, let me, let me take one step back quickly. So I think to really understand Leibniz, um, the key is to understand um, his relationship in a way to Aristotle and to a certain aspect of Aristotle's view. So, Aristotle theorized this idea of predication. We predicate one concept of another, right? Uh, and so when we make claims, um, those claims generally take the form of one concept being predicated of another. We say that man is rational, for instance, right? And here we're predicating the concept of rationality, um, where we're, 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 we're predicating it of the concept man, right? Okay, so how do claims like this, how do, how do, them, how do, how do claims like this turn out to be true? Like what makes claims like this true, right? Um, so if we take a claim like man is rational, here's, here's what makes it true. Here's one thing that you might think makes it true. When you take the subject concept man and you think about like, what is the definition of the subject concept, right? If the definition of the subject concept is something like rational animal, right? Yeah. Then we can understand why it's true that man is rational right? Simply by pointing to the fact that the definition of the subject concept man contains the predicate concept rational. It's part of its definition, right? Rational animal clearly contains rational just in the kind of myriological sense of like, it's part of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's there as part of it. Like AB contains A, so to speak, right? And so in cases like man is rational, no problem. We can kind of understand like uh, what grounds the truth of these sorts of claims. It's just this myriological containment relation, right? What Leibniz called analytic containment. Well, what about a claim like um, the cup is on the table, right? Here there's a concept, let's say the cup, and there's something that's being predicated of that concept, namely the property of being on the table. What is it that makes the predicate concept sort of belong to the subject concept in the requisite sense? to support um, that claims being true, right? How does the predicate concept belong to the subject concept uh, in the requisite way that's implied by my saying that the cup is in fact on the table, right? What is the relationship here? Now you could say like, um, so, 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 so what Aristotle says is like, unlike essential predication of the sort that takes place when I say something like man is rational, this kind of predication is sort of merely accidental predication. <laughs> the predicate term sort of accidentally finds itself in the subject, whatever that means, right? We can't, we can't appeal anymore to the idea that like, if I, if I unpack the definition of the subject term, the cup or something, <laughs> I'm going to find the predicate term being on the table somewhere in that definition. Surely being on the table is not contained in the cup, right? In that way right? In that analytic way. And so what is it that makes a claim like the cup is on the table true, right? How does the predicate concept sort of belong to the subject concept? What, what do we mean when we say that the cup is on the table? So Aristotle just has this distinction between essential predication on the one hand, where the predicate literally belongs to the subject in the analytic sense, but when you replace the subject with its full definition, you just find the predicate term there. And what he called accidental predication, which is true in the case of like contingent claims, like the cup is on the table. And Aristotle doesn't really give us very much insight into what this relationship is. He just says the predicate term sort of finds itself in the subject term, whatever that means, right? Um, Leibniz, if, if you want to understand Leibniz, the first starting point for really understanding his philosophy is to understand that he is deeply puzzled about what Aristotle means by accidental predication. <laughs> 
He's deeply dissatisfied with the idea of accidental predication. He really doesn't understand what this could possibly be, <laughs> right? What could it be for a concept like being on the table to sort of accidentally find itself in the concept, the cup, in such a way as to ground the truth of the claim, the cup is on the table. Leibniz finds that completely bizarre. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what this means. I get analytic containment. I get man is rational. <laughs> Like, I understand what it means for the predicate to belong to the subject in such a way as to ground truths of that sort. I have no idea what it means for the predicate to belong to the subject in such a way as to ground a claim like the cup is on the table if the predication is merely accidental, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So most of Leibniz's work in logic and in metaphysics is in a way his attempt to ignore accidental predication and to focus exclusively on essential predication, analytic contain. This is what leads Leibniz to the crazy view that even when we say something like the cup is on the table, there is a sense in which the concept of being on the table is analytically contained in the concept of the cup. It's there. <laughs> if you were to analyze the concept of the cup, and really understand it in its full sort of definitional sense, you would find the property being on the table included somewhere in that expanded form of the concept of the cup. So in other words, you, Robinson, the concept of you, right, mm -hmm. contains the fact. It's in there analytically in the same way in which rationality is contained in the concept of man. You, Robinson, the full concept of you, right, contains the fact that you are such as to have interviewed Noam Chomsky on such and such a day. It's I'm there so already. Glad. It's there already. It's there mm -hmm. already. And so just by analyzing the complete concept of you, I would find that fact about you, right? Now, the worry here, like this is already a create, this is a bizarre view, right, that somehow this property of you is part of your essence. It's part of who you are, right? It's part of the complete concept of Robinson. So this is a bizarre view. And the worry that Leibniz had is that it seems to render every truth necessarily true, right? So this was Leibniz's concern because he didn't want to say that, yes, while the complete concept of Robinson does indeed contain the concept of having of being such as to have interviewed Noam Chomsky on such and such a date, it's not a necessary truth that you should have done that, right? That seems crazy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, every truth becomes necessary. So Leibniz yeah. doesn't want to be led down the road to necessitarianism, as he puts it. He's like, I was on the cliff's edge, he even describes sort of autobiographically, of becoming a full-blown necessitarian and saying every mm. truth is necessary before I discovered um, something really important, right? Which is his way of distinguishing between uh, contingency and necessity in terms of finite and infinite analysis. So this is what Leibniz says. He says, it's true that the concept of being such as to have interviewed Noam Chomsky on such and such a date is indeed contained analytically in the concept of Robinson, the complete concept of Robinson. But in order to perform the requisite analysis to find that predicate in the expanded form of the subject concept, right? I have to start with Robinson and I have to explicate all of the relationships that Robinson stands in to everything in the universe, right? Until I've got a complete account of everything in the universe, at which point I can find the requisite predicates. I can find the requisite predicate concept, right? Um, it's like, it's an infinitary analysis that has to be performed <laughs> in order to see how the subject, the, how the predicate term is in fact contained in the concept term. It's one, and in the subject term rather. It's one which requires that you like trace out all the relationships between Robinson and everything else in the universe. And then eventually you get a complete picture of the universe which contains the predicate concept, right? Another way of putting this is to see the contradiction, the, the, the analytic contradiction that is contained in the claim that Robinson did not interview Noam Chomsky on such and such a date, 
what you have to do is take the complete concept of Robinson, right? Analyze it until you have a full account of the entire universe, right? At which point you will see that Robinson's not having interviewed Noam Chomsky on such and such a date contradicts this complete account of the universe insofar as it represents the universe as being something less than, um, uh, than the best possible universe. That's where the contradiction exists. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the universe in which Robinson fails to interview Noam Chomsky, uh, on such and such a date is not the best of all possible universes. Hmm. And you can find a contradiction in that fact. Um, so it's, it's a different mode. So basically even a claim like the, the cup is on the table is an analytic truth in the sense that the predicate term is contained in the subject term, but we can only discover, uh, that containment relation by performing what Leibniz calls an infinite analysis. Um, so contingent truths are still analytic. Uh, it's just that a finite mind can't recognize uh, the contradiction involved in not attributing the predicate to the subject. Only an infinite mind, like God's or something, can, can see the contradiction. Hmm. So this is how Leibniz tries to restore some sense of, of contingency in the world, right? Hmm. By introducing this distinction between finite and infinite analysis. Which, by the way, leads him in the direction of developing all sorts of interesting ideas about infinitary analysis and eventually yeah. starts him on the road to developing the calculus. Yeah, well... So, I mean, there's a long story to be told there. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite... It's For me, this, this raises all sorts of interesting questions about finitism, too, because I know he, he's a forerunner of um, interesting finitist developments in... Mm -hmm later philosophy but yeah. we're out of time now unfortunately okay. and on and Bob, i i always love talking about heim <laughs> about yeah. about it's logic fun. and i really appreciated your thoughts too on the relationship between scientific and philosophical inquiry but th this is actually the hundredth conversation i've had for the show oh, now really? and so it was wow. it was a great way to hit that number and thanks so much for doing this with me no problem. Thanks for having me. It was great. Uh, it was a, it was a great conversation. Very fun. Hold on, geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.